In the 20th century, the brass band movement was at its peak and had developed two distinct personalities, one private, one public. At the heart of its private persona were the tight-knit industrial towns and villages of Britain, but a wider public stage beckoned in the form of competition on the grand scale, epitomized by contests at the Bellevue Pleasure Gardens in Manchester and the Crystal Palace in London, where the St. Hilda Colliery Band played this epic symphony by Percy Fletcher to win the 1926 National Championship. Contests had actually been started back in the 1840s by a candle maker's son from Hull called Enderby Jackson. As with many of the leading figures who followed, he had extraordinary entrepreneurial skills. Trevor Herbert is an authority on brass bands in Britain. He says in his diaries that he got the idea from agricultural contests where pigs and cows and so on were lined up against each other so that people would judge which was the best one. And he had this idea that if you had brass bands playing, not only would it be entertaining, but the idea of judging which one of the best and the audience second-guessing the judges would add spice to it, and of course it did. It was tremendously important. He also did it in collaboration with railroad owners, so that, for example, when a brass band applied in, in writing uh, by filling in a form to enter a brass band contest, they had to put down what they were going to play, what uniforms they were going to wear, a declaration that all the players were amateur. Then they had to write down which railway station they were going to alight on and how many supporters they would be bringing with them. And uh, this formed the basis for the brass band contest, which in due course underpinned the entire brass band movement, because not only did it create an important network across the country of bands, but it eventually led to a standardization where every brass band was made up of the same number of players playing the same identity of instruments. The final element of standardization came down to the colossal influence of three northern conductors. John Gladney, who was often called the father of the brass band movement, Alexander Owen and Edwin Swift. For 30 years at the end of the century, they conducted all but one of the winning bands in the national competitions. But it's that standardization which sets the brass band apart from all other musical institutions. And that came through the contesting system with its rigid rules and controlled standards of judging. Vic Gammon of the University of Leeds. It's the codification almost of, of a set of musical ideas, a, a set of ideas of the way the music should be performed, a set of ideas that ultimately derives from Western classical music, I think, although it's adapted to meet the particular qualities of the brass band itself. And it's through the contesting that this particular national way of performing comes into being, you know, with very little regional variation, very little individuality in terms of, of different styles from parts of the country. And it's through the mechanism of the contest that bands hear each other, that they get the ideas of what to emulate, what to copy as the best way to get themselves up the league tables of contesters and so on. And now for the 2001 British Open champions. In first place, taking with them the British Open Gold Challenge Shield, the Bellevue Challenge Cup, the Mortimer Maestro Award to the winning MD, and a check for £3,000. That went to the band that drew. Number 10, Yorkshire Building Society. All the best bands play in this contest. If you win this contest, the judges decided you are the best of the best. 
It's the, by far the most prestigious contest in the world. It is I mean, an invitation yeah, contest. I mean, we've won Europeans, you... we've won Masters, we've been at London. At the end of the day, that's the one we all want. We want that big shield in our bandroom for a year, and we've got it. Members of the 2001 British Open Brass Band Champions, the Yorkshire Building Society Band. A hundred years ago, the future of this event might not have been so secure without the entrepreneurial skills of one John Henry Isles. Isles was a pioneer of the leisure industry. Around the turn of the century, he discovered brass bands and brought his money and business acumen to bear on the movement, initially through the acquisition of music publishers R. Smith & Co., and then the long-running but ailing British Bandsman magazine. Peter Wilson is one of its former editors. John Henry Isles, in a way, used the newspaper to promote his newly founded National Brass Band Championships, which took place annually at Crystal Palace. And these were marvellous events with hundreds of bands involved, all kinds of different grades of bands, and huge mass band concerts in the evening afterwards, which he insisted on conducting. But at the same time, John Henry had this wonderful vision for what bands could do. And perhaps the most important thing of all was that he realised that bands needed better music. Now, the person who had the idea that we should get Edward Elgar and all these other people, important composers, Gustav Holst and Herbert Howells and John Ireland, all these composers to write for band, was a man called Herbert Whiteley, who served as editor for 24 years. And he began to commission composers to write for the national championships. And out of that came the real core of the repertoire that still stands today. The first composer to respond to Whiteley's drive for an original repertoire was Percy Fletcher. His Labour in Love was used as the test piece for the 1913 Crystal Palace contest. From this time on, the Brass Band contest would become a prime source of new works. But has it also served to narrow the range of music played? Paul Heinmarsch is a senior producer for BBC Radio 3 with a specific interest in brass bands. The brass band test piece as such is actually quite a defined and, if you like, a specific thing. Now, in this 149th championship, they're actually playing the music of Franz Liszt, arranged in the most spectacular fashion to make it hard to play. Last year, they played a contemporary piece by a British composer, Michael Ball, very different in sound, and yet you ask the people in the audience and you ask some of the bands which they preferred playing, they'd say Liszt. Historically, and if you go back maybe over 50 years, the brass band played largely symphonic arrangements, arrangements of operatic selections, marches. You look over the last 50 years, there's been a move towards extending the original repertoire. And actually, there's a lot of music written for brass bands, original repertoire by composers dedicated to writing specifically for the medium and also people bringing in others. I, I think that's terribly important to actually engage your leading creative musicians writing music to actually write for this specific and rather strange collection of, of instruments. Paul Heinmarsh's comments seem to be borne out when I talked to players and audience alike in this year's open contest. Bram Gay's transcription of Les Prelude was a welcome return to 19th century musical values. A result which seemed to create a stir of disquiet in Birmingham Symphony Hall was the relatively low placing of Foden's band. I wondered, did the judges take revenge for them having started prior to the obligatory starting whistle? But it's a measure of the importance bands put on these competitions that Foden's had brought in Bramwell Tovey, musical director of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, to prepare the final performance. So, is this transcription the sort of thing they should be playing? I think Liszt is ideal for brass bands because 
he was a virtuoso. He was an incredible pianist, the greatest pianist of the 19th century. You can see that it's the link between Schubert and Wagner. It's just the missing, uh, the missing link. And of course, friend of Berlioz, uh, was kissed on his forehead by Beethoven when he was nine. Um, father-in-law to Richard Wagner. I mean, he's right there in the middle of uh, the history of Western music. And he didn't write in his music every single interpretive nuance that you need. And really that's good for brass and bands too because they play in a very almost spiritual and very romantic way in one respect. And so uh, for them to delve into this romantic music and to discover what's inside it, I think is very good for just basically taking an eight-bar tune and just discovering um, exactly how many peaks and valleys such a thing has. And in a lot of contemporary repertoire, of course, there isn't time or necessarily the vocabulary to do that. And I, I guess if for that reason, if only for that reason, it's important that brass bands play this kind of repertoire. There were many comments in Birmingham on how Toby had brought his experience of conducting the symphony orchestra to bear on the textures of Foden's band. But whether they won or not, it's this air of expectancy that is the very essence of a brass band contest. Just like a football cup final, the audience is incredibly knowledgeable. They know their bands and they know the star players in those bands. There's a strong element of the star player still within the brass band medium. And today, in this piece, this list piece, the soprano cornet player, the, the smallest instrument in the band, because presumably it's an orchestral piece and some of it will go quite high, that you're seeing some real quality of playing. And right through the band, you're hearing these star players. And actually, the brass band world is small enough for the audience here today, which is a packed hall, but for the audience to know who they are. And for a particular band, they're waiting for that player to come and play their piece. I mean, I can sense it listening in the hall and in the BBC vehicle. I'm waiting for X to play that bit. And I'm thinking, oh, that's wonderful. and there is only one Peter. There is only one soprano yeah. player. I thought he was awesome today. And he proved that there is only one Peter Roberts. There is only one soprano player. I'm Fantastic. sitting next to him. He's amazing. <laughs> I love him to bits. He's he really was a tour de force. Uh, in my opinion, still the leading soprano player of his generation and the present generation. He's an example of uh, being able to play and ride over the top of a band like a, a professional trumpet player would do over the top of an orchestra. And at the same time, he's also able to do the delicate passages that are demanded of, say, a string or um, even a woodwind instrument. So I take my hat off to Peter Roberts, who did so much to make this performance what it was. Peter Roberts, you had the uh, vital soprano solo today in Yorkshire's winning performance. Is that yes. one of the most difficult pieces you've ever played? Yes. The part was very high and very taxing and it was one of the, the most difficult parts I've had to play. Well, I think all the audience here thought that you were the star performer of the day because the judges didn't give you the individual prize, but I think most people thought that your performance was absolutely vital in Yorkshire winning. Yes, it is about individuals, but at YBS we have a, we have a, a good team spirit, as you can see, and it's a team effort. British Open Brass Band Champions, Yorkshire Building Society Band, playing their winning performance of Liszt's Les Preludes, arranged by Bram Gay. I can't think of any other occasion which combines the heart-stopping excitement of a major sporting event with the thrill of listening to world-class musicians at the pinnacle of their powers. Runners-up on the day were the internationally renowned Black Dyke Mills Band. Their home is the village of Queensbury, sprawling on the moors, 1,100 feet above sea level between Halifax and Bradford. It was formed under the patronage of local mill owner John Foster in 1837, and they still rehearse in the band room provided by Foster in 1855. Its secretary and historian is Geoffrey Whiteley. Welcome to Black Knight Band Room. As you can see, we're uh, still using the original music stands, solid wood, 
uh, that were constructed at the start of the band from Mr Foster. Just through the windows there we can see Prospect House where Mr Foster lived and uh, the band room's in the same shape as it always has been, rather small, which is a culture shock to most people, you rather imagine a massive emporium, but um, because of its size and its compactness, we think that's a contributory to the sound. John Foster was started in, 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 at an early age in, in business and within something like 10 or 12 years he had 2,000 employees. He started to build the mill and he gave people various options. You could continue to weave cloth in your little cottage or you could sell him the loom or you could go and work for him on his loom or you could go and work for him doing something else. And, and the thing was, people could please themselves what they did but the end result was they all worked for John Foster. One thing, unlike some other bands, you know, you, ha you haven't messed around with your name, you're, you're still Black Dyke. Now, where does that famous name come from? Why are you the Black Dyke band? Well, John Foster married uh, Miss Briggs, whose father was a farmer in the village, and, and uh, he had Black Dyke Farm, There's just not far from the van room. You can't recognise it now because the roads are being built, but there was a, a sort of a valley, and, and the, the water came down there forming this dyke, and it was named Black Dyke Farm, and its nickname was Black Dyke ever after that. And so he called it Black Dyke Mills when he built the mill, and, and it's been Black Dyke Band. And it is such a worldwide name, as we know from our emails from all over the world, we cannot possibly let it go at all. Of course, you're, you're by far the most successful British band. You became famous in the Victorian era, and I suppose foreign travel started at that time. Yes, in 1906, uh, that, I mean, when one bears in mind that we're 1,100 feet above sea level, I say, for the band to go to Manchester, say, they would come out of the band room in, looking like lifeboatmen from an early age, get onto a wagonette and be driven down into Halifax to catch a train to Manchester. Well, that journey today would be horrendous, even, you know, just to do that in an open wagonette. And then in 1906, to go to America on, on a 20 weeks tour, must have taken some organizing. In these times, in the late 1800s, 1900s, um, things were not good uh, for, for a lot of families. And indeed, we have here an agreement that was made out for Mr. Scatley, for one of the players in the band, when they went to America, which more or less uh, says that uh, he would get two pounds a week, which was a tremendous pay then. But the weekly sum of 15 shillings would be paid to him, and the balance would go to his uh, lady wife. It details, it's like a deed from a house, really. I mean, there's some terrific detail in here, but it shows that they did, did have concern for everyone. I mean, um, she was going to get the net profits um, of the sum, it would get £25 uh, advanced by the company. This was for the tour of America in 1906. Geoffrey Whiteley of the Black Dyke Mills Band. John Foster's symbiotic relationship with his players appears at odds with an image of brass bands in the forefront of the trade union and labour movement. One particular powerful 20th century image sticks in my mind, that of the Tylerstown and Mardi Colliery Band in the South Wales Coalfield leading the defeated miners back to work after the 1985 strike. It's an image which is perpetuated to this day in events like the Durham Miners Gala, where former colliery bands march through the town behind their lodge banners before listening to a programme of political speeches. May I extend a warm welcome to uh, everyone of the gala today and express our gratitude to our members, their families and the mining communities for their continued support. Also to those trade unions and organisations who have displayed their solidarity and support for the gala by marching in with their banners along with our recovery bands and our banners.
the Durham Miners Gala, although a shadow of its former self, and perhaps the day more akin to a heritage event, remains a highlight of the Northeast Brass Band calendar. It's a public display of the movement's long association with trade unionism. But is this the full story? Dave Russell of the University of Central Lancashire. Most brass bands took what was effectively an apolitical stance. Even bands that were associated with pit lodges in the northeast of England would sometimes take on engagements with organisations that you would not normally associate them with. The most extreme example I ever came across was a brass band in 1839, the Bramley Band in Leeds, that played for the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party on the same day. But certainly Brighouse Borough Band in the early years of the 20th century led a Labour Trades Council demonstration in the morning and two weeks later played for a Conservative Garden Party. There were individuals within the Brass Band movement who, of course, were very strong allegiance to trade unionism and to the Labour movement, and sometimes to the Labour Party and the Communist Party and other organisations. But I think it's, this again, back to this notion of it being a movement, that when you're a brass bandsman, you dissociated yourself from ideological causes to serve the band, and for bands to survive, they had to almost play for anybody who asked them, with, with, obviously within certain limits and they saw themselves as available to the community. And bands would even change their names rather than alienate potential groupings. I mean, St Hilda Colliery Band in the 1920s dropped the colliery from the title after the general strike. The Gravesend Workers Band in Kent dropped the word workers from their title, specifically to try and break a kind of popular association, an association in the public mind with left-wing radical politics. It's quite interesting also that the labor movement itself, although obviously used brass bands, I mean, they, they lead strike processions, the Durham Miners Gala and, and one or two other events have become massive, crucial events in the brass band calendar. But there's a surprising sense in, in which the labor movement itself never fully integrated with the band movement. The far left in Britain certainly always seemed to want to produce almost an alternative culture rather than feed from some of the pre-existing elements of working class culture. And to me, this was borne out in this year's Durham Miners Gala. Yes, there were the political speeches and the bands coming together, but I got the impression that there were two separate events going on, with the diehards hanging on to every political utterance, whilst the bandsmen and women were there simply to enjoy themselves. Of course, political and social conditions have changed since it all started in 1870, and crowds, once upward of 100,000, have dwindled. But in essence, the event stays the same. Ian Watson is senior curator for Tyne and Weir Museums. Miners Gala Day has a very traditional format. The brass bands all march onto the racecourse field. They hear the political speeches about lunchtime. And then a lot of the people who've come onto the field go up to Durham Cathedral for the miners' service at 3 o'clock. Normally only about three brass bands go up. 2001 is an unusual year in that five bands are actually going up to the cathedral. The reason for that is because this is the 50th anniversary of disasters at Easington and Eppleton, and so two extra banners are actually going to be marched into the cathedral this year, and the cathedral really will be packed with people. It isn't because the men lost their lives along with two rescue brigadesmen, and at Eppleton there was nine men lost their lives. I want to take this opportunity to dedicate the rest of this year to the memory of those miners who sadly lost their lives 50 years ago.
The tune Gresswood, named after the Northwest mining town which lost 265 of its men and boys in 1934. A tune written following that disaster by a Durham miner, Robert Saint. It's become synonymous with mining communities and has been played at the Durham Miners Gala since it was written in 1936. This year had a particular poignancy. Cecil Peacock was a playing member of the Easington Band when disaster struck 50 years ago. It was on uh, Tuesday, May the 29th, 1951, at half five in the morning. There was 81 killed originally, and then two of the rescue men died during the course of the rescue operations, so made a total of 83. I was at school at the time, where I took part in all the funerals, uh, 54 in 10 days, which you never forget, marching up and down Easington Street, and of course two Easington bandsmen were killed. Uh, Bobby Milburn and Bobby Thompson. The 54, the figure I come to that I mentioned earlier, is because that for one day all the Catholic people were buried together. There was 19 of them. And so they had one funeral for 19. So hence the, the difference in funerals to uh, the people killed. Uh, and that was a very moving day. Lovely hot weather. Uh, marching up the street. Everybody knelt on the sides of the streets. Communities in those days were very close, but Easington seemed to close in on itself, you know, to mourn. I'm quite emotional now even thinking about it, you see. Close community, every household affected either by family, friends or whatever. And uh, I don't think in many ways Easington ever recovered. Yes, the quarry started again and worked in 93. But I think as a community it started the decay. And when you go to Easington now, the quarry's gone, of course. One of my father's favourite sayings, one day they'll give the families fail back, is exactly what they've done. It's all grass. A lot of houses have been uh, demolished and uh, the businesses are going, the schools are closed, we haven't got a bank. In many ways the band is one of the last bastions of the original Asington and uh, the fact that today they're leading the parade and going into the cathedral I think is a good example of that. Cecil Peacock of the Easington Colliery Band and as they march slowly past me before disappearing up the magnificent aisle of Durham Cathedral, it's the words of Gresswood which really bring home the unique place of brass bands in their communities. We remember miners who have died, trapped in the darkness of the earth's cold womb. Brave men to free them vainly tried. Still their workplace remained their tomb.